Hey there, all you Broadway babies. Welcome to Broadway by Ghostlight. I'm Mark Bonani, and a special shout out to my small but mighty group of subscribers. There are dozens of us. Dozens! Thank you all so much for sticking with me. Welcome. If you haven't subscribed yet, go ahead and do that now. It would really help me out, and I promise I'll make it worth your while to the best of my ability. I don't believe that for a second. Now, before I get too crazy into begging for likes, Let's go ahead and dive into our breakdown for this week, the musical Minnie's Boys from 1970. I sometimes put up polls in different Facebook groups or on Twitter, uh, asking for uh, suggestions on what shows I should do. I usually put up four sample shows that I sort of am interested in doing a breakdown of, but encourage people to add their own. And the last time I did this in a Facebook group, somebody added the show Minnie's Boys to the list and it ended up winning. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. So let's look at this semi-obscure Broadway flop. Minnie's Boys is the somewhat mostly true story of the Marx Brothers and their uh, pushy but lovable mother, Minnie. The show starred Shelley Winters in the title role of Minnie as well as Louis J. Stadlin as young Julius Marx, a.k.a. Groucho. Minnie's Boys opened at the Imperial Theater on March 26, 1970, and closed just a couple months later on May 30th, 1970, after only 80 performances. That's not very long. The show did have 64 preview performances. So many previews, so many previews, so many previews which is an extremely long preview period, even by today's standards. Part of the reason it had such a long preview period is that it didn't have an out-of-town tryout like a lot of shows were still doing, and some still do today. But even so, Minnie's Boys had quite a tumultuous preview period, with many changes being made to the show, as well as the creative team. You're all fired. But we'll get into all that off-stage drama later. First, let's delve into the musical itself, and break down the plot of this short-lived show, shall we? Showtime. I love that overture. Act one begins on the Upper East Side of New York, as the neighborhood is out and about. Two mothers are gossiping about all the trouble the Marx boys have gotten into recently when Minnie Marx enters. Minnie wholeheartedly agrees that her boys are terrors. Those boys are such terrors. And she sings the song, Five Growing Boys. If it isn't one thing, it's another. When you're the mother of five growing boys. Five growing boys, Rose middle name is crazy. The set then changes to the family's living room and we meet the family. There's Sam, the boy's father, and Minnie's husband, who goes by Frenchie. And then there's the five growing boys themselves. We have Julius, uh, also known as Julie sometimes, who would later be known as Groucho. There is Leonard, who would later be known as Chico. There is Milton, who would later be known as Gummo, though he didn't really appear in any of the films. There's Herbert, who would later be known as Zeppo, and finally Adolf, later changed to Arthur for obvious reasons, who would later be known as Harpo, the Marx Brothers. Minnie and Frenchie are furious with their son Leonard after they found out he's been playing craps with their rent money on rent day. The father Frenchie goes to whack Leonard with a broom handle, but Minnie stops him. So in frustration, he whacks Julius instead, and we first get our first glimpse into the Groucho style. Julius says, hey, Pop, what'd you hit me for? And Frenchie says, for having a brother like him. To which Julius replies, don't blame me, I wanted a dog. I, I really can't do a good Groucho impression, so just bear with me as we get through this plot. Fasten your seatbelts. It's going to be a bumpy night. Herbert comes home and informs his folks he's been in trouble at school for belting the principal in the mouth. I may have punched him. It's a blur, sir. His father says that's no way to get out of school, to which Herbert replies, oh yes it is, I've been expelled. <laughs> Adolf comes home and tells many more bad news. He does not have the money for rent either. He's been fired from his job. 
Of course, just right then, there's a knock at the door, and it's a very angry Mr. Hockmeister, their landlord, and he wants the rent money. How we gonna pay? The family all try various scams and diversions to get rid of the landlord. Look over there! Where? But none work. In a last-ditch effort to save her family, Minnie takes out her last $3 and gives it to the boys, and the Marx Brothers go to work. They let in Mr. Hockmeister, and Julie makes sure and assures him that they will pay him all of the $9 that they owe. But to make sure it's all fair and all above board, he'll hand it to him $1 at a time. As he's telling Mr. Hockmeister all of this, the other boys are quietly cutting a hole in Mr. Hockmeister's pocket. Then, of course, Julius hands Mr. Hockmeister the first dollar in his hand. He takes it, puts it in his pocket, which then the boys take out of his pocket and go hand to hand through all the boys until it finally makes it back to Julius's hand and right back into the hand of Mr. Hockmeister in a circle till it gets all his nine dollars. The old reach around it. The scheme seems to totally work and the landlord leaves happy. But there's a knock at the door again and the family scatters, hiding in all sorts of various comical hiding places. But it's not the landlord, it is Uncle Al, Minnie's brother, who is Al Sheen of Sheen and Gallagher, the world famous vaudeville team who uh, was a very big star in his own right. Al brandishes his new solid gold cane and informs the family he's just got a big raise playing the Palace Theater in New York of $150 a week. In those days, that was a lot of money. Al and the family then pontificate about wealth and sing Rich Is. Rich Is, never let the money burn a hole in your pocket. Just blow it. Rich Is, walking out the door and making sure that you lock it. You know it. Riches, having the moolah to scratch where you itch. No more celluloid collars and no more squeezing your dollars till old George Washington hollers. That's rich! After the song, Minnie approaches her brother Al, trying to get Julius into show business. Now, Julius protests. He does not want to be in show business. He wants to be a doctor. Doctor, may I have an OK on this, please? Mm, I'm too busy right now. I'll tell you what, I'll put the O on now and come back later for the K. But his mother is not hearing any of it. So she sends the boys to go wash up for dinner and corners her brother some more. She makes the case that her family is broke and desperate. Well, well right now we're all broke. And the only thing that her boys will excel in, that's not illegal anyway, is show business. Al reluctantly agrees to help his sister and tells Minnie that a friend of his in Coney Island is looking for a boy singer and she can send Julius over there. We then see Julius downstage right in a spotlight next to a placard that says Julie Marks Boy Nightingale. As he starts singing his song, the crowd starts to boo, fruit is thrown and he's yanked off with the hook. Lights come up back on the kitchen set stage left where Frenchie comes home very disgruntled with Herbie in tow. Herbert has lost his job again, this time as a plumber. His boss told him to give him a wrench, so he hit him upside the head. Why are you always hitting people? Minnie decides the only thing to do is to send Herbert along to Julius on the road to be in the act. She figures, after all, the way Julius sings, he'll need a bodyguard. Ha <laughs> ha! Back to stage right in the spotlight, but now the placard reads, The Two Nightingales. The boys sing, but more booze, more tomatoes being thrown, and the hook. Back to the kitchen on stage left, we see Minnie writing to her boys, telling them that their brother Adolf will be joining them on the road. Apparently, it was either that or 30 days hard time for harp theft. Back to stage right, the three nightingales, no good, the hook. Back to stage left in the kitchen, it's Leonard's turn to get in trouble. Oh, Leonard. The cops bring him home after raiding the brothel he works at, which he's always told his folks was a boarding school. There they were, a schoolroom full of them. Boys, girls, teachers, romping around stark naked, bare as the day they were born. So now he has to go join the act as well. And with four of her five boys out on the road, now in Texas at this point, she decides to go on the road with them as well. The stage clears and we see our debut of the four Nightingales. But newcomer Leonard is a no-show. Hi, hello, how are ya? 
Yeah. Uh, how'd you do? Backstage after the show, the theater manager, Mr. Sidebart, comes back and is furious. He feels he's been gypped out of a nightingale and threatens the family with a gun. Guns. So primitive. Minnie assures him that if Leonard is missing, there must be an extremely good reason for it. But of course, as they start taking the set away, one of the flies goes up to reveal Leonard playing strip poker with a very undressed young woman. Leonard is the man! To make matters even worse, that young woman happens to be Mr. Sidebark's daughter. Well, that's, that's not great. As he starts going nuts, brandishing his gun everywhere, the family bolts. The Marx family scatters throughout the theater to avoid Mr. Sidebark's murderous rage just as the next number begins on stage. It's the song Underneath It All, performed by Maxie, a female impersonator. Underneath it all, I'm still the same. Still the same, still the same. Unspoiled by luxury, unchanged by fame. Unchanged by fame. Of course, as the number goes on, the backstage chase gets brought on stage and various Marx Brothers antics ensue. The next morning, after all the chaos, we find the family on the porch of their hotel waiting for a wire of money from Frenchie so they can get home. The wire finally does arrive, but instead of money, it's a note saying, Dear Minnie, please send $9 for rent, Frenchie. Son of a bitch. Minnie slumps in her chair sadly as the starving boys go on the hunt for some food. Adolf, though, stays back because he feels something is just not right. He takes the telegram out of his mother's hands and sees that it also says happy birthday. It's Minnie's birthday and the boys have all forgotten. On your mother's birthday? Adolf feels bad and wishes he could get his mother something. He sings the song Mama a Rainbow. Mama a rainbow, mama a sunrise, mama the moon to wear. It's not good enough, no, not good enough, not for mama. After the number, the boys all return and Leonard has a Mr. Robwell with him. Turns out he's a theater manager and wants to hire the boys. But not for singing, he explains. He loved the way the boys fooled around on stage last night and all of their antics and wants them to do a comedy act. The boys, of course, start to say that they don't have a comedy act. I don't have an act. But Minnie's inner stage mother takes over and she assures Mr. Robwell that they have an amazing comedy act. Mr. Robwell leaves satisfied, but the boys protest. They're tired of being lousy and having food thrown at them. They just want to go home. They don't want to be on stage anymore. Can we go home now? Minnie, however, tries to convince them with some good old mother's guilt and sings the song, You Don't Have to Do It For Me. If you want to potter around in the gutter, well, there's the gutter. Go and potter. All right, so pull the chain. Four sons go down the drain. Who listens anymore? Why should you do it for me? After the number, we find ourselves in a vaudeville theater where the boys perform their brand spanking new comedy sketch. It takes place in a classroom with Julie as the teacher. But despite the audience's roaring with laughter, the manager tells them it's just not working. They don't have any sex appeal in their skit, so they need to hire a girl singer or get out. All I need now is the girl. The next performance, we see that the boys have indeed found a girl singer. It's their mother, Minnie, dressed in a giant bunny costume. They sing the song, If You Wind Me Up, which sadly was not recorded on the original Broadway cast recording. Why? 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 Why would they do this? Backstage, their dad, Frenchie, comes after having just seen their act. Uncle Al comes backstage, too, but he's not alone. He is accompanied by E.F. Alby, one of the most important men in the history of vaudeville. But to the boy's dismay, he tells him he didn't really care for the act. I can't believe this. So, so what are you saying? You didn't like my act? He tells him people in the sticks might find that funny, 
but people in New York at the Palace Theater are much too sophisticated. What a dick. He reluctantly says that maybe he'd tour them around for a little while, see if they could be polished up into anything, and we'll see. But Minnie will have none of that. She defiantly tells Mr. Alby, you'll take my boys to the Palace Theater now, or not at all. And Mr. Alby chooses not at all. Well, that really backfired on me, didn't it? The boys are devastated. They are furious with their mother and tell her they don't need her anymore, fighting their battles and lousing things up for them. Minnie is heartbroken and makes a very dramatic exit. The boys commiserate over their lost opportunity and sing, Where Was I When They Passed Out Luck? Where was I when they passed out talent? Right up front, get mine. Oh, when it came to the line where they handed out luck, where was your smart, clever friend? Back showing off his talent and brains to the bums lining up at the end. Intermission! And you know what you do at intermission, right? That's right, Timmy, you subscribe to this channel. Here we go again. Go ahead, hit that subscribe button now. It would mean a lot. And, uh, oh, act two's about to start. So I guess let's take our seats. Let's go. Act two. Act two opens on the kitchen of Mrs. McNish's boarding house in Perth Amboy, New Jersey. It's Christmas time, but the boys are anything but jolly. They've been on the road for a year now and their new manager has stolen all of their money. They have no money for food or rent, and they can't leave the boarding home because Mrs. McNish has taken all of their luggage hostage until she gets her money. Well, I think this really sucks. Just as all hope seems lost, Minnie arrives. She tells the boys that it's too bad she's not their manager anymore because she could get them to play the Palace Theater in New York tonight. But she doesn't want to overstep her bounds. Now you listen to me. I want details, and I want them right now. I don't have a job. I have no place to go. You're not in the mood? Well, you get in the mood! The boys are eager for information, and she milks the situation for all it's worth until the boys finally get her to spill her plan. She relents and tells them that they are going to go on in their Uncle Al's place at the palace tonight, because Uncle Al is going to get appendicitis exactly five minutes before he's to go on stage. Well, how convenient. Now the only issue is Mrs. McNish still has all their luggage with their props and costumes in it, and Minnie only has enough money to get all the boys on the train back to New York. What a predicament. They hatch a scheme to steal the luggage back, while Julius distracts Mrs. McNish with some mushy-wushy, which Julius thinks is a terrible thotsy watsy Julius calls Mrs. McNish into the kitchen and lays on his particular brand of Groucho charm slash insults. He sings the very funny You Remind Me of You. You won't think it rude of me, will you? If I say your face is familiar, we're practically strangers, but still you look familiar. You remind me of someone. You really do. Three During the song, the boys make out with all of their luggage and they're off to the Palace Theater. In the next scene, we are back in the old neighborhood where the neighbors are all talking about how amazed they are that these troublemaking boys are now the biggest thing in vaudeville. Minnie and Al arrive and talk about how they love the success that their family is having and they all sing the title song, Minnie's Boys. Who'd have thought we'd ever be hearing from Minnie's Boys? Back at the offices of the Palace Theater, Mr. Albee is having a time. There are a bunch of performers in his office all complaining about the antics of the Marx Brothers and how they're mucking up everyone else's act. Mr. Albee kicks all the performers out just as the Marx Brothers are coming in. The boys know that they're a big hit and they want more money. What we're talking about is money. Real money. Amigo money. No dough, no show. 
Mr. Albee, however, has signed them to a five-year no-raise contract, and he intends to hold them to it. The boys desperately want a new contract and a raise, but Mr. Albee says no deal, and not only that, they'll now have to pay a fine every time they disrupt someone else's act. The boys then go full Marx Brothers mode and break into their world-famous contract routine. Well, I don't know. It's all right. That, that's in every contract. That's, that's what they call a sanity clause. <laughs> you can't fool me. There ain't no sanity clause. Okay, sidebar. I find it a little weird that they do this scene, this well-known Marx Brothers scene, like word for word, the contract scene. It, it's, it's almost like a jukebox musical where it's like material not written for the show, but they wedge it in somewhere. It's like a, a joke box musical. That's all right. Minnie's Boys is a joke box musical coined. That phrase is trademark. After the contract bit, chaos ensues. You have Adolf ripping the dress off one of the secretaries. You've got Herbert starting a fire in one of the trash cans and roasting marshmallows over it. Just madness. Madness and stupidity. Mr. Elby has had enough finally and breaks. He tells the boys their contract is broken and they are through in show business. You're through and you're done. The Marx Brothers, however, are smug and say, well, the Schuberts have been after us for weeks, so we'll just go work for them. But Mr. Alby informs them that he bought out the Schuberts last week. He says, I own vaudeville and you will never work again. This is no good. <laughs> Back at home, Minnie is on the phone, desperately trying to get a booking for her boys but everyone is way too afraid of Mr. Alby and no one will hire them. This is no good. <laughs> the family commiserates together and Minnie decides to give up show business forever. forever. All that flies out the window, however, as soon as Leonard walks in with some great news. He has been in a poker game, of course, with a Mr. Gates who owns the Walnut Street Theater in Philadelphia. A great, great theater still in operation. I've seen one show there, Gaslight, it was wonderful. I have a whole story about it for another day. If you could, please limit your comments to the matter at hand. Anyway, Mr. Gates owns the Walnut Street Theater and it's been dark for over a year. So he's losing money on it anyway. He tells them if they could put a show together and use his own sets and costumes and everything that are still there from his last show, they can use the theater for free. Hey, that's a pretty good deal. Minnie, of course, has stars in her eyes and is all for it. Julius, however, he's not interested. He says that he does not want to be in show business anymore and he leaves. The other brothers are not sure about trying to do a show without Julius, but Minnie tries to cheer them up and encourage them and sings the song, Be Happy. All I want, all I ever wanted, was for all my boys to be. Life's a beautiful mess, but live and nevertheless be happy. We're now at the Walnut Street Theater as the family, sans Julius, looks around the abandoned theater and all the set pieces that are around, clearly with a jungle theme to them. Welcome to the jungle! And there is a bit where Minnie is in a jungle hut and it gets flown up into the rafters. It's this whole comedy bit. But you have to sort of see it, you know. And use your imagination. But the problem remains that they just can't think of anything to do for the show without Julius. Luckily, of course, because this is a musical comedy and that's the way the world works, Julius shows up to save the day. Hooray, hooray, hooray. So they have to come up with something for a show, so the boys then start to rummage through all the costumes. We then see them, one by one, put on pieces and adopt their legendary Chico, Harpo, Groucho, Zeppo personas. They all sing the act. Okay, I'll go with the old professor. Smoke a cigar. Make with a flirty eyes. I'll be the straight man, and you play off me. No, that should be me. Right, you guys? How would it be? I use the accent. Hey, mister, what's the matter, you? As the song swells, electric lights begin to display all the names of the future's Marx Brothers movies as the curtain falls. The end. Well, that covers a lot of ground. Say, you cover a lot of ground yourself. Well, what'd y'all think? Again, 
The dialogue is very, very funny. I tried to include little bits and pieces, but unless you want a very terrible script reading from me, it's hard to convey the humor in this show, which is great. I, again, I recommend you read the script if you can get a hold of it. The book for Minnie's Boys was written by Arthur Marks, Groucho's son, and Robert Fisher, who had done a lot of writing for Groucho in the past. I bet you'll never guess who suggested those two to write the book for the show. Three guesses who? Yes, it was, of course, Groucho himself, who was hired by the producers as creative consultant, which by all accounts, including Groucho's, meant that they basically just paid him money so there was no legal trouble from the Marx family. How do you like that? That's pretty neat, eh? The score had lyrics by Hal Hackety and music by Larry Grossman. The score definitely has its admirers, and one song in particular, Mama a Rainbow, had a bit of a life outside the show. It was recorded by Jim Neighbors as well as Steve Lawrence. Mama a Rainbow Mama a Sunrise Hackety and Grossman would write more shows together as well as apart, but all of them sadly would be flops. That sucks. As I mentioned earlier in the video, Minnie's Boys had a long and chaotic two-month preview period. Book writer Joseph Stein, who had famously written uh, Fiddler on the Roof, among others, was asked to come in and help doctor the script. Original director Lawrence Kornfeld was replaced by Stuart Pranger, and choreographer Patricia Birch was replaced during the run with Mark Bro. During the preview period, the creative team cut and sliced their show to bits, removing several songs and scenes and replacing them with others that many felt were inferior to the ones they cut. Things have gotten worse, not better. It was such a chaotic time of adding in scenes and songs that the original Broadway cast recording contains two songs that were eventually cut from the show. What the hell are they still doing here? Star Shelley Winters had a really rough time during the show. She had a really hard time remembering all the changes and memorizing all the new scenes and also battled laryngitis during the run, which was especially hard on her because she already wasn't that great a singer. You said it, not me. Although she had appeared on Broadway in musicals before, she was a replacement Edo Annie during the original run of Oklahoma. That's a fun fact. There were constant rumors that star Shelley Winters was going to be replaced at some point, but those rumors never came to pass, probably because it had such a short run. But throughout the run, Tensions between the star and the cast and crew were certainly strained. At one point, according to the legendary musical theater historian Ken Mandelbaum, 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 there was even a performance that Winters walked out on and her understudy had to go on script in hand. That would have been a wild performance to be at. When the show finally did open, it received pretty mixed to negative reviews. Clive Barnes in his New York Times review famously wrote, the idea for a musical about the Marx Brothers before they really became the Marx Brothers is splendid. Whatever happened to it? Oh. <laughs> Minnie's Boys closed after just two months, losing $750,000 on a $550,000 investment. It's not a good investment, that's a loss. So what happened? Why did it fail? Well, I think the main failing is just in the very concept of the show. The audiences, the world, love the Marx Brothers. They're hysterical, they're amazing. And in this show, people were rooting for, they were invested in the lives of these boys. I was rooting for you, we were all rooting for you! But the show isn't called The Boys, it's called Minnie's Boys. So Minnie was the focus of the entire evening. And with a star like Shelley Winters in that role, she certainly was going to be in almost every scene, whether she was needed or not. It also was clear to a lot of people that the show was, was kind of a retread of Gypsy, the overbearing stage mother pushing her kids into show business, sometimes against their will. Um, it had a lot of the same sort of song types in it, a lot of same song cues. Ethel Merman's a stage mother who really pushes her daughter. I don't have time to explain the plot of Gypsy. Yeah, but this was no Gypsy. I mean, what could be Gypsy? The show's main character, Minnie, was just not as interesting as Madame Rose and was never going to be. As one uh, audience member reportedly put it, the show was going great and when it was getting really funny, the mother would come in and gummo up the works. <laughs> and that is my breakdown of the musical Minnie's Boys. I hope you all enjoyed it and learned something new. I learned a little. Thank you all so much for watching. Another big shout out to my supporters and my subscribers out there. Thank you to the people who have sent me really kind notes of encouragement, uh, telling me that you love what you're seeing. That really 
warms my heart. I cannot even tell you how much. Uh, so keep them coming. Send me your notes. Send me your suggestions for other shows you might like to see broken down. Shows you've always been curious about. Thank you all so much for watching. Share this video with the Groucho in your life. I'm Mark Bonani. This is Broadway by Ghostlight. I'll see y'all next time.